coal-powered steampunk nation finds itself facing major political change and internal social unrest. In Isolate, that's the book I'm reviewing on this episode of SFF 180. Hello again, everybody. Thomas here, your host as always, coming to you once again from gorgeous, scenic Southern Oregon. <laughs> Thank you all so much for joining me. Ellie Modisett Jr has published over 75 novels in a long and distinguished SFF career. And now at the age of 78, shows no signs of slowing down with his new series, The Grand Illusion, a political drama set in a steampunk gas lamp secondary world in which rapid industrial advancements are resulting in wealth inequality, job loss, pollution, social turmoil, and massive corruption. In the nation of Guldor, Stefan Deckard works as one half of the personal security detail for Councillor Axel Oberdur. Deckard's partner, Averly Sella, is an empath with the ability to both detect the presence of other people by picking up on their emotions, as well as project emotions onto others. Stefan, on the other hand, is an isolate, naturally able to block his emotions from being picked up or affected by empaths. Together, they make a formidable team. Goldor has three political parties. The Craft Party represents artisans and the working classes, and Oberdor is its leader. The Commerce Party, who hold the majority, represent big businesses called corporations, and they are openly plutocratic and authoritarian. The Landor Party more or less represents old money, and they are the most socially conservative of the bunch, the kind of people who will disown their daughters for pursuing their own independent careers. Oberdor has been very effective at increasing the number of craft seats on the council. So effective, in fact, that he's been targeted by more than one assassination attempt, each time thwarted by Deckard and Isella. Isolate explores a country in the midst of major political sea change. Now, what I found most compelling about it and what made it so believable is how modest it shows that it is never just one momentous event that makes people finally decide they're fed up and strike back against their government, but an ongoing series of seemingly small crimes and injustices that actually aren't small at all. They're just the kind of thing the general public can ignore, especially in a nation where the press is not completely free. Here, everything starts with a scandal involving illegal coal mining leases. And then Isela's brother-in-law, working for a firm building a new naval facility, disappears after he discovers something suspicious regarding a sudden replacement of the building plans. It all looks like commerce or corruption is ramping up, with corporations resorting to outright criminality in stamping out smaller competitors who offer better work at better bids, while complicit commerce or politicians enjoy pocketing a little graft. This has led to violent protests and even outright domestic terrorism by a radical underground group called the New Meritorists. Now, neither Deckard nor Oberdor support the rioting, but Deckard in particular understands the anger motivating it over the way the commerce-led government has found ways to kind of work around provisions in the Great Charter, which is Goldor's constitution, specifically designed to prevent corrupt behavior there is a solid chance that the existing council could be dissolved and brand new elections held, which might give the Kraft Party the chance at a majority for the first time in 200 years, especially given the increasing participation of women in the political process. Now, <laughs> while it is tempting to think it, Modisett isn't offering this novel as any kind of explicit commentary on the current state of American politics, although it's easy to pick out where he's been inspired by it. Many science fiction writers are overtly political, right? Whether it's Ken McLeod on the left or Heinlein and Jerry Pornell on the right, but Modisett writes stories about politics that aren't polemics. He's a writer who has always been, first and foremost, an ideas man. He is interested in systems and laws and praxis and how nations either succeed or fail at solving their structural problems. The grand illusion of the series title is the idea that a nation can preserve any of the noble ideas it was founded upon and not allow them to be abandoned or betrayed without both great struggle and by taking the long view. Everybody wants massive change right away, and they all believe they can make it happen. 
In reality, it usually takes years, even generations. Sometimes you have to compromise or play both ends against the middle. But even slow change is worth fighting for, and integrity and conviction need constant vigilance. Now, I will be the first to tell you that Modisett, even though he has had a very successful career, is absolutely not a writer for everyone. Now, in a manner maybe similar to Robin Hobb, he is never in any particular hurry to get his stories where they're going. His books are long and talky. It isn't exactly that he info dumps, but he writes in great detail about mundane day-to-day -day work routines. He likes to describe what every character is wearing and how the rooms they hold banquets and take committee meetings in are decorated. <laughs> this level of meticulously detailed writing admittedly has not always worked to his advantage and his less good books can be every bit as dull as they sound. But somehow in isolate, everything clicks. The story is among the best work Modisett has ever done, intellectually satisfying in a way speculative fiction rarely is anymore. And even though the book runs 850 pages in paperback, Modisett's writing maximizes reader immersion. Now, if you're someone who loves intricate or even obsessive world building, this book will give you such an overdose of that, you'll need to go to rehab. I mean, I really felt like I was living in this book, not just reading it. And the story is grounded in two of the most appealing characters Modisett has ever written. Now, true, he does like to write the same kind of protagonist each time. His heroes always tend to be hyper-competent, very rational. They approach every problem by diligently thinking it through. But Deckard feels like a real guy, even though he's often too serious and professional. Coming from a family of prominent artisans, but lacking talent himself, Deckard pivoted into his security job, even though everyone, especially Isella, lets him know he has far greater potential. He's smart, and he does what needs to be done, but he knows his weaknesses and shortcomings. And he has no ego problem <laughs> in letting himself be guided by a smart and more experienced woman. And I must confess, I even enjoyed their romance. Possibly because it's refreshing to see a couple of adults navigating their long-simmering feelings for each other in the midst of adversity instead of, you know, the, the cheesy fantasy novel insta-love. And the way Modisett takes such a chaste approach to his romantic subplots, it's really pretty charming. So, if you aren't put off by a humongous tome that requires patience, thought, and commitment, a book that's the exact opposite of a light read, <laughs> a book that wants to challenge you and doesn't mind if you argue for or against its ideas, Isolate will transport you to a rich and deeply tactile world, just enough like our own, that you'll be thinking about both long after it's over. And there you have it. That's all I have time for on this episode of SFF 180. You guys know the drill. The most important thing is that these are reviews. You will not always agree with me, but if you enjoyed watching, please hit that like button, share the video far and wide with all of your SFF reading friends. And above all, please subscribe if you have not done so, because that is how the channel grows. You can also support my channel at my Tee Public store and at my Patreon where recruits into Wink's army get little perks like getting early access to some of my videos if I finish them early enough. <laughs> I want to thank all those people for their added support because I use the Patreon money to pay Matt Olson, who is my incredibly gifted and talented channel artist who does all my amazing thumbnails and things for me. So thank you all for the extra support. I want to thank all the rest of you guys for being the very best viewers in all of BookTube. And until I see all of you next time, stay safe and healthy and happy reading.